All right, well, we are on part 18 of a series called Meet the New Season by a ministry called Little Open Book Ministry. Uh, his name is Henry Cha. And uh, for those of you that may be new or have, I haven't done, I haven't been diligent in telling you where to find the study materials, there, we have a website for the class. It's called manaforthelastmile.com. Manaforthelastmile.com. Forget that, you can ask me afterwards. Um, and we are on part 18 of a series on the sanctuary. In particular, it focuses on the most holy place experience. And we are on the third part. He believed, uh, the study is broken up into modules. And this module is a topic called the Sevenfold Cleansing Messages of Revelation 14. And this is for part three. And uh, I'll be reviewing that, uh, some of the overview in a minute. But today I'm going to depart from what I normally do a little bit. Uh, I'm going to hit just for about five minutes. I'm going to talk about it, an outline and an overview of the lesson for today. But I want to point out some things for you to make sure that you don't miss them. But I'm not going to talk about them today because they speak for themselves. Uh, a lot of the study for this week, it's very good, but it's academic. It's, it's things just to know, to connect dots, but it's not real practical. And I've been looking for a place for several weeks to insert uh, some discussions I feel we need to put in here, uh, and it, it really dovetails well today with the lesson having to do with righteousness by faith, getting a better understanding of what is righteousness by faith, what is the message of Jones and Wagner that was sent in 1888, and how does that differ from what most of us probably understand today. Um, I'm going to try to make it as simple as I can, so pray for me. Uh, many have tried this. <laughs> And we will try again today. So, just in a nutshell, let's look at what's in the lesson today. Uh, he starts off and he says, there is, there is more to the three angels' message of Revelation 14 than is commonly understood, and much study and prayer needed to unlock their deep meaning. And he quotes Evangelism, page 196. It's up on the screen if you want to read it with me. It says, the theme of greatest important, importance is the third angel's message embracing the message of the first and second angels. Let me pause there. We talked last week and the week before about how the three angels' messages are progressive. And so in other words, a lot of people come in on what we call the third angel's message. They learn the Sabbath and the state of the dead and all these different things, but they really don't understand the first angel's message uh, as they need to or in depth. And so until you understand that, and then move to the second, from the second to the third, you can't really embrace the full impact of what this message is all about. And that, I propose to you, is a big part of why this church is just lukewarm and, and floating down the river and not moving forward to give the loud cry. And I believe when we unlock this, we start really focusing and trying to experience these messages, that the Holy Spirit's gonna be poured out very quickly and the work will be finished very quickly. And I think we're getting to the point that that's gonna happen soon. Let me continue reading. It says, all should understand the truths contained in these messages and demonstrate them in daily life, for this is essential to salvation. So in other words, you can't just know them. You have to experience them, and uh, you have to, it says, uh, demonstrate them in the daily life. How do you demonstrate coming out of Babylon in the daily life? And how do you demonstrate fearing God in these things? We're going to talk more about that today. We shall have to study. Now listen to this last line. We have, we've had some people ask, do you really think the people out there are going to study and understand all of this deep stuff that we're studying that is very deep and hard to understand at times? Uh, you know, and, and the answer I gave is once we get it and the power of the Holy Spirit's with us, they're just going to look at us like Peter and say, what do I need to do to be saved? We're going to tell them they're going to do it. But for those of us that are on the, the, the giving the message side, we have to experience, we can't give what we don't have, can we? So we have to understand it and receive it. Right now, if we have a wrong understanding of the gospel, okay, if, to, to give a simple analogy, if the gospel is the pouring out of the Holy Spirit, God's Jesus ministry for us, and he pours it out in a certain place, if I'm over here, does it do me any good? So I have to understand these messages properly to position myself and get myself ready to receive this blessing. And until I do, he waits because if he, if he pours it out, we're not going to be able to receive it. That could be very, very bad consequences for us. So it says, we shall have to study earnestly, prayerfully, in order to understand these grand truths, and our power to learn and comprehend will be taxed to the utmost. So it does take a lot of study to really put all this together 
and make it clear, all right? He then goes into a very interesting uh, study, which I'm going to skip today, and that is uh, the people, it talks about those that dwell in heaven is the term that's used, and people, nations, multitudes, and tongues, and the angels, and they represent different groups of people. I'm going to leave that to you to study. It's good. You should study it if you get, if you get a chance. Um, he says that the angel fly in the midst of heaven's us, but we are not currently... Uh, we are not currently flying in the midst of heaven, giving that loud cry because we have not been empowered by the Holy Spirit yet. So the question is, why is the loud cry not happening now? And why cannot, you know, we can't point to a single occurrence of this in our history. And uh, why cannot God's people today be correctly re represented by this angel flying in the midst of heaven? It's because the latter rain has not come. And the latter rain has not come because we have not understood and cooperated with Jesus in the most holy place ministry to receive the power of that latter rain. All right. Then he goes on to talk about those that keep the commandments of God. He talks more about the health message. We talked about that last week. This is a progressive message. He breaks it down into seven steps. Three in the first angel's message, one in the second angel's message, and three in the third angel's message. I'll look, we'll look at those steps in a minute. Uh, the last two are the health message and righteousness by faith. Last week, he got into talking about how many of us just kind of blow off the health message. And that, that is, that's one thing that's precluding us from moving on to a proper understanding of righteousness by faith and going into the most holy place. Then he talks about the faith of Jesus, which is what we're going to focus on today. Uh, what is the faith of Jesus? That is actually the gospel or righteousness by faith, which we're going to see. Okay, so with that, I'm now going to switch into um, the topics that I thought we need to augment this study with. this. Okay, so I already read you that one. All right, so last week there was a couple points I didn't finish in the study that I thought were important. And just to, just to summarize it so we see how this all connects and flows. So the third angel's message shows us the way into the holy place. All of the three angel's messages are pointing us to the heavenly sanctuary. You can read many statements that say this in early writings. Our pioneers believe this as well. And the third angel's message in particular leads us right into the most holy place with Jesus for that experience. It says, uh, early writings 260 says, those who rejected the first message could not be benefited by the second, neither were they benefited by the midnight cry, which is, was to prepare them to enter with Jesus by faith into the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. And by rejecting the two former messages, they have so darkened their understanding that they can see no light in the third angel's message, which does what? Okay, is that what you think about when you read the third angel's message? Okay, that, that's the point. As we study, the, the language that's used in the three angel's message is symbolic, and we have to break it down like we've been doing to understand the impact. But you see, we have to, how does, how does the third angel's message that warns about taking the mark of the beast and then finishes with, here is the patience of the saints, here are those that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. How does that show us the way in the most holy place? We're going to see today. Here's another statement out of early writings 256. It says, many saw the perfect chain of truth in the angels' messages and gladly received them in their order and followed Jesus by faith into the heavenly sanctuary. These messages were represented to me as an anchor to the people of God. Those who understand and receive them will be kept from being swept away by the many delusions of Satan. So what I would say in a nutshell is this most holy place experience is the last and final phase of the gospel. It is the finishing of the mystery of God of the gospel. It is uh, producing the 144,000 that are the first fruits that have overcome by the power of Jesus in the most holy place experience to stand in his presence when he comes. And they go through the time of trouble without an intercessor and they stand without sinning because if they did, they'd be gone. There's no more intercessors. We've already covered all this. I'm just reviewing. Okay. So just to review. This portion of our module is talking about the sevenfold uh, message of the three angels. The first angel was conviction, confession, confession, and conversion. It represents the early reign experience. It transforms us into the image of Jesus largely, but it still relies heavily on, on imputed righteousness, meaning that we continue to progress and we're made like Jesus, but we don't fully reflect the image of Jesus uh, just through the early reign experience. This is what all of our predecessors 
in the Christian church have had. It is the start of righteousness by faith. It's also represented, we saw last week, how many times did Jesus cleanse the temple in his ministry? Two, right? One at the beginning, one at the end. The one at the beginning represents the early reign experience, the one at the end, the latter reign experience. We're gonna talk about the latter reign experience today. Okay, this second angel is the call to come out of Babylon, so after we're converted, we have to come away from the teachings of these other gospels and churches, from all of the things in Babylon that distract. God's calling us away to be sanctified, separated, holy. And then the third angel was a call for Sabbath reform, which we saw was not just keeping the Sabbath holy, but keeping all the commandments of God, because you can't keep the Sabbath holy if you're breaking the other commandments, can you? Okay? And then health reform. And we talked about how uh, that is really where a lot of people are stopped now. We just discount that. We were we saw that it is the right arm of the third angel's message. Yeah. What's the difference on the, how the list is made up here? What's the difference between the first angel's message and the message of going into the holy place? Conviction, confession, conversion. Is that in the holy place? Yes, I believe it is. So it appeared that there should be more to it in the first angel when you get into the most holy place than just a repeat of what happened when you go into the holy place. Right. Well, there's a deeper understanding. Yeah. Uh, and, it, you know, just uh, the experience is deeper. I understand what you're saying. Yeah. I don't know that I'm prepared to get into a deep discussion about that right now. <laughs> Uh, so last week he hit on the health reform, and I think, I mean, we all realize we need to follow good health principles because we saw several statements last week that say if we break natural laws, health laws, physical laws, we are actually breaking moral laws as well. Okay, so that brings us to today, righteousness by faith. Now, again, these are progressive. As if, if we don't deal with one, we might think we're at righteousness by faith, but if we haven't come out of Babylon, we're not getting the righteousness by faith right. If we haven't dealt with the health message, then it's it's uh, standing in the way of us really moving forward. Okay, so righteousness by faith is the last step, and as we saw, it is the way that we enter into the most holy place experience. It is victory over it, righteousness by faith means victory over sin in the heart, not just behavior. And this message was sent by God through Jones and Wagner to focus on Jesus and the gospel, not just the commandments of God. Okay, so the early, the pioneers focused on keeping the commandments, but in the end, they got so focused on the commandments that they sort of let Jesus become secondary. Can you keep the commandments without totally being filled with the Holy Spirit, being surrendered to Jesus? Okay, so righteousness by faith then uh, is a total surrender to the Lord. And as we enter into this final phase of Jesus' ministry, he's doing a deeper work than he did in the holy place. And so we have to have the holy place or the early reign experience to the full before we are prepared to receive the latter reign. If we haven't even received the early reign, then God will not send the latter reign. Does that make sense? It's like that parable that says, to he that has, more will be given. In other words, if you use what you have, more will be given. If you're not using what you have, even what you have is taken away. All right, so that's kind of a nutshell. And this, this uh, latter rain experience of righteousness by faith is equivalent to the second cleansing of the temple of Jesus. All right, so that brings us up to where we want today. So the question I have for you is, where are you? Where do you think you are anyway? in this sevenfold path that we just went over. Uh, are you stuck in Babylon? Are you stuck uh, on one of the commandments that you're stumbling with? Are you stuck on the health message? Um, I think a lot of us may actually even be through the health message, but do we have the right understanding of righteousness by faith? That's what I wanna talk about today. There are two things I wanna talk about today, and that is, uh, well, let me, let me go over this slide first. It says, John 12, 35, Jesus said, Walk while you have the light, lest darkness come upon you. This is out of Great Controversy, page 31. It says, Those who turn away from the light which God has given or who neglect to seek it when it is within their reach are left in darkness. All right, so the, the principle is simple. I think we all know it. But it's not just knowing these things. You can't even really fully know these things. It's a progressive message. So if you're not receiving the message, uh, whether it's uh, something to do with coming out of Babylon or the health message, 
If you're not allowing that to be applied in your life, you're stuck on that step. Okay, you may think you're okay, but you're stuck there. And that's why you don't go further and understand, oh, there's more to this message, all right? It says, uh, then John 8, 8, 12 says, he that follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Whosoever is with singleness of purpose seeking to do God's will, earnestly heeding the light already given will receive greater light to that soul. Some star of heaven, heavenly radiance will be sent to guide him into all truth. So in other words, it says, if you're really seeking to do what we're learning, that it, it calls it a star of uh, heavenly radiance. That's an angel. That's a, that's a minister of the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit will be sent to you if you're willing to do what you're learning. Pretty simple concept, isn't it? But if you're not applying what you already know, you're stuck. The Lord can't work with you. He's waiting for you. All right, so um, I'm going to skip over this. What I want to talk about is two things today from here on. All right? Two things. The one thing that has been coming up, especially for those that have not been sitting through and studying through with us in the class, um, we've talked about how we need to surrender ourselves to the Lord. There's a lot of things, we, all these things that we need to surrender and get in harmony with the Lord. But with all that said, no matter what we do, we know that there's got to be a final work of cleansing if we're going to fully reflect the image of Jesus. You with me? Okay. And we have to do that. Why? What did we learn early on? Is there going to be a mediator in the sanctuary once probation closes? So if you're going to stand, you've got to stand without sinning. Now that's pretty scary. If I think about my experience so far, the Lord has brought me quite a ways and he's transformed me. If you looked at where I came from and now, you'd say, wow. But when I look now, as I get more and more of the Holy Spirit and understand more, I see I have even a further way to go. And that can be pretty uh, discouraging if we don't realize that as long as we do our best, he's going to finish it off with a miracle and through the light of rain. Now, a lot of people have stopped me at that point and said, do you think you ought to be teaching that? That's heresy. That's cheap grace. But I'm telling you, it's not. Let me give you an example. Uh, the blind man that was sitting on the side of the road when Jesus came, saying, Son of David, have mercy on me. Do you think no matter how hard he tried, no matter what he did, without a miracle, is he going to see again? Okay. The leper. He's got leprosy. Okay, no matter what he does, no matter how much he follows the law of Moses and does all these other things, is he going to be healed from that lep leprosy without the touch of Jesus and the miracle working power? Yeah. It's the same for us. Does that make sense? Amen. Yeah. Okay, so we have to position ourselves by receiving the early rain and being transformed. Every day we need to be overcoming sin. Okay, this is not a message saying you don't have to overcome sin. It's the opposite. You have to receive the full extent of Jesus' ministry in the most holy place. And when we do, then we are ready. Jesus says, well done, and he, he finishes the work. Here? Give it. Oh, I, I'm sorry, over here. Yeah, I, I think that it's very important to uh, note also in this context, you know, it said that we will be without a mediator. But we cannot forget that, you know, if, when the, the, ones, the believers are in this stage, that's when they are sealed with the Spirit. The Spirit is with them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the Spirit is going to be with them, and that, that's where you know I, I, I don't. I would I avoid saying you know be, that we are not going. To, these people are not going to need fear. You know, I mean, we're you know we. Only, Absolutely. Think, it's only, the only fear is that we are going to cause blindness on God. You know, and that's you know. Absolutely. It, it's not going to be self-concerned. Yeah. Uh, all the way through. You know, right. It's going to be the Spirit. It's going to be a so we're so going to engage with the Spirit, and I think. I agree with the fact, you know, we have to explain it in that way, you know, because I, I think, well, you know, because yeah. I think that's the truth, you know. Yes, yeah. absolutely. So to sum up what you're saying, right. While we don't have a mediator, Jesus didn't leave us. Right. Right. You still, we, we have to have the Holy Spirit right. more than ever mm -hmm. to stand through the time of trouble. Right. Right. So it's a matter of being emptied of self so we can fully receive the righteousness of, in the Spirit of Christ. Right. Amen. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So. Uh, the latter rain, and, and I'm going to just hit this quickly because I'm uh, kind of getting pressed on time to get in up here. Somebody got to tell me what time it is. I can't see it on my computer right now. 10 20. 10 20, okay. Um, so the, the main point I want to, I'm not going to read all this. I'll just read you the key. The great work of the gospel is not close to close with less manifestation of power of the power of God than marked its opening. So in other words, what you saw at Pentecost 
is nothing compared to what's coming in the latter rain. Okay, so it's many multiple times what you saw. Did that make a huge difference in what we saw about Peter uh, the day after the cross versus 40 days, 50 days later at Pentecost? Unbelievable. So that's the kind of miracle that Jesus wants to do for each one of us. That's what he's going to do if we're faithful like the disciples were. Did they make themselves righteous? Or was there a miracle working power that hit them and they became bold and fearless and full of the Holy Spirit? That's what's coming. Uh, when this happens, it says, Servants of God with their faces lighted up and shining with holy consecration will hasten from place to place to proclaim the message from heaven. By thousands of voices all over the earth, the warning shall be given. This is a loud cry. Miracles will be wrought, the sick will be healed, etc. Okay, so this is what's coming in the latter rain. Now, this is a chapter out of Testimony to Ministers. I think it's called The Latter Rain, something along that line. Uh, it's on page 506. And what I want to demonstrate here is something that is very important to understand. As I read this, I want you to pay attention to how many times again and again it is pointed out that the latter rain does one purpose, okay? Jesus spoke in parables about agriculture often. In this case, he uses the early rain. And what does the early rain do to a crop? It starts it, it grows, and it develops to a certain point. But notice as I read this, the latter rain has to come to finish the job. If it doesn't, the crop never comes to fruition. So the early rain's good, but the latter rain is what finishes the job. Is that clear? That's what the most holy place uh, message is about, is that if we are willing to receive the former rain, then that most holy place ministry of Jesus through the latter rain perfects the crop. You find the latter rain talked about in Joel 2.23 and James 5, 7, uh, just a couple of places, it's other places as well. So let's read this together. It says, the latter rain falling near the close of the season ripens the grape, excuse me, the grain, and prepares it for the sickle. So what does the latter rain do? Right. Prepares the crop to be harvested, right? Yeah. The ripening of the grain represents the completion of the work of God's grace in the soul. Okay? It doesn't leave any question what it's talking about. By the power of the Holy Spirit, the moral image of God is to be perfected in the character. This is character perfection. Now we go from being made like Jesus to reflecting the image of Jesus fully. Okay? We are to be wholly transformed in the likeness of Christ. The latter rain ripening earth's harvest represents the spiritual grace that prepares the church for the coming of the Son of Man. But unless the former rain has fallen, there will be no life. The green blade will not spring up. Unless the early showers have done their work, the latter rain can bring no seed to perfection. All right, so it's pretty obvious, but let me just sum it up. You look at agriculture, what happens if you stop watering the crop halfway through? What happens if it doesn't get enough water and it's still alive, but does it really bring fruit? No. 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 So you've got to have the early rain. So we're not saying you can just sit down and wait for the latter rain. In fact, what would happen if the plant's not getting enough water? And when the time for the latter rain comes, normally you'd have fruit that's green and about this big and it just finishes it off, like it's a piece of corn or something. But what happens if the corn's this big and it's kind of sickly and then the latter rain comes? You just seal the fate of that crop, right? It's done, because it didn't get mature to the point the latter rain could help it. Does that make sense? Yeah. So this is how the two are related. So it then says, unless the early showers have done their work, the latter rain can bring no seed to perfection. So we're not saying to disregard the latter rain. On the contrary, if you don't receive it in full, you will not receive the latter rain. It goes on, many that have in a great measure failed to receive the former rain, they have not obtained all the benefits that God has thus provided for them. They expect that the lack will be supplied by the latter rain. When the richest abundance of grace shall be bestowed, they intend to open their hearts to receive it. They are making what? A terrible mistake. Okay. So it's not some magic thing that's just going to take care of you if you just sit around and, and enjoy life and you don't dig and try to go forward with this message, Charlie. It's inverted. Ten virgins, yeah. Some some never get this idea. Okay, so we need to receive all of the la of the early rain before the latter rain will do us any good. It says the heart must be emptied of every of every defilement and cleansed 
for the indwelling of the Spirit. It was by the confession and forsaking of sin, by earnest prayer and consecration of themselves to God, that the early disciples prepared for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. Look what it says. The same work, only a greater degree, must be done now. So am I preaching a cheap grace message? Yeah. If I'm telling you that you've got to have even a deeper work than the disciples did at Pentecost, is that cheap grace? Mm -hmm. Who's going to do that work? Mm -hmm. We have to surrender, but the Holy Spirit and Jesus are going to do it in us if we allow it. But there must be no neglect of the grace present, represented by the former reign. Only those who are living up to the light they have will receive greater light. Unless we are daily advancing in the exemplification of the active Christian virtues, we shall not recognize the manifestations of the Holy Spirit in the latter rain. Listen to this last sentence. It may be falling on hearts all around us, but we shall not discern or receive it. This is kind of a frightening statement. Okay, So this powerful latter rain, it's not going to come in a way you go, wow, I want some of that. If you have not received the full portion of the early rain, the people around you can be experiencing this latter rain and you won't even know it's happening. That's what this is saying. The blessings received, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, the blessings received under the former reign are needful to us to the end, yet these alone will not suffice. While we cherish, so, so let me stop there. Is it obvious from this statement and what we've read so far that until Jesus does the work beyond what he's done for any other generation, we're not going to reflect the image of Jesus fully? Is that clear to you? Okay. It says, while we cherish the blessing of the early reign, we must not, on the other hand, lose sight of the fact that without the latter reign to fill out the years and ripen the grain, the harvest will not be ready for the sickle, and the labor of the sower will have been in vain. Let us with contrite hearts pray most earnestly that now, in the time of the latter rain, the showers of grace may fall upon us. As we seek God for the Holy Spirit, it will work in us meekness, humbleness of mind, and a conscious dependence upon God for the perfecting latter rain. Notice that the dependence has to increase on God. This will be important in a minute when we go over another point. Okay? Yes? Former rain. People on say we need to receive former rain, but then we need to understand exactly what that is in order to um, receive the matter. Right? Yeah, the former rain represents the Holy Spirit power that was poured out at Pentecost and has continued since. It's available now. It's what uh, it's what changed the disciples at Pentecost, and it's available to us now. The reason the latter rain is not poured out is because we have not received the early rain that is available to us already. Does that make sense? It's really pretty much that simple, yes. Um, so I'm just trying to have an understanding. So the early rain or the former rain is, could you say that that's like sanctification? It's not like a moment of rain, it's like a season of rain? Yes, very good. Okay. Yes, it continues. It started at Pentecost, it's continued. And uh, as we receive the early rain, we're transformed day by day by day, more and more into Jesus' image. So it's a work of the spirit in the life, day by day, moment by yes. moment. This is the Holy Spirit experience that we have had to this point. We have not really had the latter rain experience. Okay, so, but we must receive the full outpouring of that early rain before the latter rain is going to come. Yeah. yeah I think we uh, need to, in this context, we need to look at you know what's the function of the Spirit, and Jesus talks about it that he, when the Holy Spirit comes, it will convict of sin and of righteousness. So there, there's a, that process there initial process that begins with the earth, with the uh, first angels and second angels and so forth is a progressive like you talked about you know it, we're convicted of sin and the need for righteousness and we cannot begin to see that light you know we're, we're just talking about concept but it, it experientially i think you know we have to recognize what's the function of the spirit what where, where is the uh, what's the objective and how are we how is god going to get us there and i think it's the vehicle it's one of the vehicles that i see in, in the uh, you know the, in the uh, early there in the gospel, it includes and I mentioned it to you last week, and I think it's so important for us to recognize that Jesus he came in the flesh and he overcame in the flesh, and then that it, it's a necessity for to get to the objective to get to, uh, to live with God in eternity, so that there is actually it's actually going to be victory. It's not only a forensic uh, justification, right. but it's also. The, 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 uh, that the subject that are got involved in this mess, us, yeah. you know, that we, he's going to take us there. And that's going to be... Exactly. 
through a vision that we see through the spirit, you know, we're going to see, you know, the shadows, we're going to see the help message. It's like, wow, you know, God is going to take us there. And, we, and then we begin that little process, you know, it's a small process. And uh, I think that's the beauty of it, you know. Yep. Yeah. So victory is a key, a key word in there, you know, that actually we have, we have to step outside of the world that we live in where the natural self follows us just a pattern, whatever they want. But here is a, a, a process yeah. that we learn to love, to follow a different process, which is actually contrary to what I want here. Right, which is the working of the Holy Spirit. Right, right. We have to receive that. Yeah, real quick, and then we got to go. You know, correct me if I'm wrong, because we all know that the early rain was the time of gospel but to me personally when you receive Christ as a personal savior in your first experience that's a early rain to me. sure absolutely yeah and then you grow on by reading and studying you know, to the majority of that yep absolutely time. yeah very good okay so we see the early and latter rain uh, so now let's talk about what that means in terms of the message of righteousness by faith uh, when we talk about the message of righteousness by faith, are you aware that the spirit of prophecy tells us that the third angel's message is in reality righteousness by faith? Okay. Now, if you read it without really digging into it and understanding it, you can't get that out of it, right? You have to really dig in. But ultimately, it says in verse 12 of Revelation 14, it says, here's the patience of the saints. Here are those that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. How do they keep the commandments? By the faith of Jesus, right? Through faith, we receive the grace of the Holy Spirit to keep them. So, uh, righteousness by faith is synonymous with the faith of Jesus. And this is a reference to the gospel and the message of righteousness by faith. The faith of Jesus is the faith that believes Christ's righteousness completely, totally, entirely saves the believer from sin, to your point. Victory over sin. We are preaching victory over sin. But it's not by our power, it's by Jesus' power. Amen? Amen. Okay. This transcends the typical evangelical understanding of the gospel that only allows for forgiveness of sin, but not entire deliverance from its power and presence. This is why the 1888 message was not just a rediscovery or reiteration of the gospel taught by the reformers, Protestant reformers. Righteousness by faith is not just covering sin, that's the evangelical gospel, but complete deliverance from it. That's the three angels' message for righteousness by faith. Okay, quickly, I'm not going to go over the whole thing, but if you just pay attention to, you see that the sanctuary is depicted in three boxes, the courtyard, the holy, and the most holy. These represent the complete, the plan of salvation to deliver us completely from sin. In the first uh, box is the courtyard, and that represents the sacrifice of Christ that pays the penalty of sin. He died for every single person. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him, that means anyone, uh, should not perish but have everlasting life. So it's, a, it's an invitation to, put, to let Jesus pay for your sins. But to do that, you have to enter into the covenant which is depicted in this process. If we accept that, we come into the courtyard, we confess our sin. Then we move to the second box, which is the holy place. That represents Jesus ministering for us, and there we can receive not only forgiveness, that's where a lot of Gospels today stop, but also repentance. Repentance is a gift. You can't repent to earn forgiveness. It doesn't work like that. You go to Jesus and say, I'm a mess, I hate this about myself, and you ask, give me a change of heart. And it comes with forgiveness. But if you don't accept the change of heart, you don't get forgiveness either. Does that make sense? Two sides of the same coin. So, 1 John 1, 9 says, If we are willing, faithful to confess our sins, he is faithful to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. For those that do that, their sins are now transferred into the sanctuary, and they wait for the Day of Atonement, which we are now in, and the most holy place ministry of the high priest, Jesus. And there, he will blot out our sins, which we will not be able to remember once he blots them out. Now, that is unique about our gospel. You know that? Well, it's the Bible gospel. We will not be able to remember the specifics of our sin. I don't know about you, but that makes me very happy. <laughs> so the memory of our sin is gone, but also, ultimately, we're going to be delivered from the presence of sin as well. Amen. All right? So this is a complete Savior in all aspects. It's not just alleviating us from the penalty of sin and then sitting down and waiting until Jesus makes us perfect again. 
It doesn't work like that. Okay. Any questions on this before I move on? Wow. Is it that good? Is that, <laughs> did that good or did that bad? One of the, yeah. One thing that I have just kind of contemplated on is that sometimes we just stay in the courtyard. We yeah. just confess and confess. And oh, yeah. We move into that repentance. Um, and then thanks for the most holy, but um, Satan wants to keep us there. He wants to keep us from truly repenting of sin. And he's, you know, just confessing should be enough. Then you go back and do the same thing and you confess that again and the cycle. Right. Yeah, and, and just to that point, it's so true. And you know, if you're stuck in that loop, you're not alone. All of us are going through that. You know, the Lord will convict us of sins. You go forward, you think you repented, and then you find yourself doing it again. Okay, this is normal. Don't give up. But you do need to overcome it. And if you keep at it, if you're persistent, you will. It took Mary Magdalene seven times with Jesus Jesus himself to get rid of her demons. Amen. But she got rid of them in the end because she didn't give up. So don't give up. Amen. Okay? So with that, I think the most clear thing, and how am I doing on time, Charlie? No reason. Okay, I'll do my best here. Uh, so this, I think, is probably the most important thing for us as a body of believers that we, I don't believe, have a clear understanding of. And that is righteousness by faith. Okay? I, for the sake of time, I'm not going to go to Isaiah 6, but most of you know the story. This is where Isaiah is taken in vision into the throne room of God. He's taken into the most holy place. If you read it, that's the experience he has. He has a most holy place experience. Is that what God's people at the end of time are supposed to have? Okay. And what happens to him when he goes in there? Does he say, wow, God, glad to meet you. What's his reaction? Woe is me, for I am undone, for I am a man of unclean lips, etc. Right? Uh, and he is in despair. Well, that's going to be what happens when we get closer to Jesus and go into this most holy place experience. So we need to understand that, and we're going to run from that experience. If we think that we're supposed to be getting better, and then we get close to Jesus and see we're not getting better, because the truth of the gospel is you as a person in the, in the flesh do not get better. Okay, And I'm going to explain that. But you have to understand that's coming. But you see Isaiah... And God directed an angel to come and touch his lips with a hot coal, and it says, Behold, I've caused thine iniquity to pass from thee. Almost the same words as what we read in Zechariah 3, which is a picture of the most holy place experience of God's people at the end of time. When we do our part, have the early rain experience, the latter rain comes and touches our lips with a hot coal and causes our iniquity to pass from us. Not just in part, but in full. Something that's never happened to a generation of God's people before. Can you say amen to that? Amen. Okay, but we got to have the right understanding of righteousness by faith. Now, this is simple, but I'm telling you, unless this has really been made plain to you, you probably have the wrong understanding of what righteousness by faith is. Here's what I'm going to show you. This is typically what most people think and preach in the Adventist church. This is what Jones and Wagner came to fix. Okay, this is a normal way of thinking about the gospel unless you have gotten past this. And what it is, this chart depicts, and the dark red is our righteousness. And the light red, or pink, whatever you want to call it, is Christ's righteousness. And the way that we have typically and historically understood this is that when we come to Jesus, as you see the column on the left there, conversion, when we come to Jesus, we have very little righteousness. So Jesus has to make up this difference. In fact, I've heard it preached this way. Jesus will make up the difference. And that's true in one respect, but not in this respect. Okay? He makes up the difference. Then we grow, and we have a little more righteousness, and Christ has to cover a little less. And then we get into later growth, and we have a lot of righteousness, but Jesus still makes up the difference. And at maturity, now, and ultimately, I'm standing on my own. Can that be the gospel? Does, it, does the gospel call us to become more or less dependent upon Christ at every step of the way? Okay, so can this model possibly be right? No, but if you're like me and like most people, subconsciously, you're thinking that, you know, when you pray, if you pray, God, make me a better whatever. Make me more patient. Make me, you're praying the wrong prayer because your flesh, your carnal mind will not get better. All you can do is deny it. Are you with me? Okay. So this is the wrong idea of righteousness by faith. Here is what A.T. Jones had to say. 
He quotes uh, Romans 8 7. It says, Because the carnal mind, the mind, our natural mind, the mind of the flesh, is enmity against God. In other words, it's at war with God. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Your carnal mind, your fallen mind in and of itself, cannot be made to like the law of God and to follow it. That's what this is saying. It can't be done. Listen to what Jones says about this. There is no possibility of that enmity being reconciled to God. Nothing can be done with it but to take it away. God himself cannot make the carnal mind, the mind of the flesh, subject to his law. It cannot be done. This is not speaking with any irreverence toward the Lord or limiting his power, but it cannot be done. God can destroy the wicked thing and all that ever brought it, but he cannot do anything for it to reform it or make it better. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Okay, so the bottom line is we do not get better, we get deader. <laughs> are you with me on this? Okay, if you want, you can turn to Galatians 2.20. I'm just going to quote it. I know well, it says, we are, I, Paul says, I am crucified with Christ. Amen. What does it mean to be crucified? Amen. It means to be put to death, right? I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I that lives, but Christ that lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh with the carnal mind, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Amen. This is what it means to live the gospel. Your mind, you do not improve. Your mind is not going to be conformed and suddenly you standing on your own are going to be made like Jesus. You're going to, be, you're going to deny the flesh. You're going to deny the, the, the carnal mind. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, it will be basically put to death so that now Christ can live in you in its place. Okay? This is what it looks like. This is the correct understanding of righteousness by faith. When we come to Jesus, we are full of self. You see the light green is self. The dark green is Christ's righteousness. Oh, it changed here. I guess the devil doesn't want us to have this. <laughs> now I can't see it. There we go. Let's try it again. It's coming. Okay. There we go. All right. So this is a very important slide. All right. So you see at conversion, uh, the, the light green is self. And the dark green is Christ's righteousness. When we come to the Lord, we have no idea how sinful we are. But the amount that we know, we confess, we forsake it, and we're saved. Because the imparted righteousness of Christ covers all that self that he hasn't revealed how bad it is to us yet. But as we move forward, early growth, we see, oh, there's even more than I thought. We surrender that, and we become more emptied of self. It becomes crucified more and more. And so now that we're emptied of self, now and only then can Christ now fill us in the void. Are you with me? We continue in later growth. It continues. And in full maturity, there is no longer any of Mike left. It's only Christ that lives in you. Amen. Amen. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, I have a question. So I totally understand and agree with the fact that self never, the flesh never gets better. Right. But obviously some part of us has to get better, right? So what is that? What part of us becomes more righteous? Um, okay, so the part that's more righteous is Christ that is in you, right? It, it changes our behavior. We agree, you know, our, Paul says, that, you know, I, I want to do what's right, but I do what's wrong. But through the power, we crucify that. And now we basically cling to Christ as our righteousness, our guide, and our power to do that. So in that respect, we are better, right? But it, it, apart from Christ, we're no different than we were when we started. Mm -hmm. Right? That's my only point. Could, could we say that it's our will that becomes more sanctified? Yeah. Our willingness to always That's a good way to say it. Jesus. Because it's submitted to Jesus. Yeah. When your will is fully submitted to Jesus, then you are fully righteous. Yeah. Thank you for the clarification. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. Thanks. Sure. Yes. Totally the opposite. And as we come to Christ, we see our maturity. And the more 
more we come closer to him, we will see our lack, our, our unrighteousness. And that's not going to feel good. <laughs> no. To the point, we get to the point of Jacob's time of trouble. We're asking ourselves, are we completely clean yet? Are we, are we cleansed yet? Are we you know, ready to be translated yet? We're not sure even then. Because we see the difference between us and God and Jesus, of course, and his righteousness. So that can be discouraging because you, you, you may feel not good about yourself dying. And that's afflicting your soul. But at the same time, we have the joy of having Jesus in our heart, knowing the peace that comes with him. And I think that's where we, um, that we're going to feel that regardless of how we feel. Yes. So I think we have to learn to distinguish the two. Yeah. Let's read this. This answers you. You segued us perfectly into kind of wrap things up. Charlie, what time is it? Forty-six. Forty-six. Okay. So let me read this. This this speaks to exactly what you're saying. Okay. This again is A.T. Jones. He's talking about this whole process. It's exactly what Sharon's saying. It says. Uh, this is Review and Herald, April 18th, 1899. It says, Do not be discouraged at the sight of sinfulness in the flesh. It is only the light of the Spirit of God and by the discernment of the mind of Christ that you can see so much sinfulness in your flesh. And the more sinfulness you see in your flesh, the more of the Spirit of God you certainly have. This is a sure test. Then, when you see sinfulness abundant in you, thank the Lord. You have so much of the Spirit of God that you can see so much of the sinfulness and know of a surety that when sinfulness abounds, grace much more abounds, in order that as sin is reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So this is what I'm saying. We are not conditioned for this experience. When we have it, we think something's wrong, and we run back away. But as you come closer to Jesus, you're going to see yourself as worse and worse. But if you know that that's the case, we're all in the same boat, by the way. Does that make you feel any better? I mean, we are. We may think we're better than the other guy, but we're not. Okay. So when we have this experience, if we know this is the Holy Spirit, and as long as I'm willing to say, I don't want anything to do with that guy, I'll take Jesus, thank you. When we do that, we become more and more dependent. The worse you see yourself, the more dependent upon Jesus you come. Amen? Amen. And that's the whole point. Okay. Uh, I saw a hand somewhere. Yes? Uh, I agree that the blood covering us is not working because I think it's Leviticus 17 11 says the life of the flesh is in the blood. Can you talk this a little louder? Yeah. The life of the flesh is in the blood. Leviticus 17 11. You know, we don't, in, we can't survive if the blood is on top of us. It obviously has to be inside of us. And so our blood is no good, right? It's we need a transfusion. Filthy. We need a transfusion. I've never had a transfusion. Maybe someone in here has. But in order for the transfusion to work, you have to commit to going somewhere and sitting down and allowing it, something to be stuck into you and allow it to go through. And I imagine it takes more than one time. And so it's a process. You know, I'm, I'm in a study right now, a Zoom study with some people leaving Bill Lehman. Uh, I don't know if anyone's heard of that, but it's all about righteousness by faith. And just going through that book is, I can't imagine, do you try to resent this righteousness by faith in one hour? And I mean, we've been doing it for months and we're not even a third of the way through. It is a big subject, but the transfusion idea, I think, is a really good illustration. I yes. Understand. It's a process, and I think there's two key, key ingredients that I've learned, which is love and, uh, <clears throat> sorry, I forgot the other one, but I think it's. Yeah, yeah, good comment. Yes. So uh, this quote, like for me, it gives so much courage, you know, like hope, uh, because Satan used our weakness, our sinful state against us. Yes. But God is trying to see, you know, the closer, like Isaiah, the closer, like we come to God, the more we see unrighteous, our unrighteousness. And it reminds me, um, Matthew five, uh, verse three, where it says, "Blessed are the poor in spirit." for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Yes. So mm -hmm. it's just God saying, happy are you that are putting your fear properly. 
and you see many on the right of him because the kingdom of heaven is yours. So, and then about the righteousness, and then it says, the, the righteousness by faith is God laying down the glory of man in the dust. Mm. So it's just like, you know, the Lord showing to us. Yeah? <laughs> First line. <laughs> so, Go ahead, I'm sorry. Yeah, it's just the Lord showing to us, you know, um, yes, we are poor in spirit, yes, we see unrighteousness, but that is the time that we are closer to Him. And yes. there, 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 there will not become a point where we will feel like, yes, I have made it. Even when we are sealed, we're still saying, is there anything else, yeah. you know, in me? Right. So it just give us hope that although we see that, that weakness and unrighteousness, yeah. that does not give us. Right. Amen. Amen. One last thought, you know, on that thought. Jacob's wrestling is something that we're going to have to go through that is akin to this. When Jacob first, when, who, who did Jacob wrestle with? Jesus. Jesus, right? Did he recognize Jesus as a friend at first? No. no. Thought he was an enemy. See, it's, it's representative of this process, right? At first he thought he was an enemy, and then when he realized what was going on, he hung on to Jesus and wouldn't let him go. That's the experience we have to have. And from the looks of my wife moving up, I think we better wrap up. <laughs> All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you very much. Uh, Lord, it is so hard to cover this topic. Uh, we just barely touched on it. But I pray that this would be a stimulus for people to, all of us, to look deeper and to understand what it is you're trying to do. Give us courage. Give us hope. And fill us with your spirit, we ask. Let us move forward. Let us put aside the things of this world that we might receive your Holy Spirit, we ask. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. amen.